Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Do not keep striving, do not keep worrying. The nations of the world strive after all these things. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> if you've been here all summer, you know that our lections are found in those 10 chapters between the 9th and, 20, and 19th chapters of Luke's Gospel where he has told us that Jesus has set his face now toward Jerusalem, that he has left Galilee in the north. He is skirting around the Samaritan territory on his way to Judea and the capital city of Jerusalem. On the way, a young man asked him to make his brother divide the inheritance with him. Jesus refuses, but instead tells them a story about a rich man who had the biggest harvest he had ever had in his life, and rather than sharing, decided he would tear down his barns, which would be inadequate for this new harvest, and build much bigger barns. And when he got the bigger ones filled, he said, Ah, soul. Relax. Eat and drink. You have good stored up for many years. And though he had been talking only to himself in this story Jesus told, suddenly God, who had overheard everything, said, You fool! Tonight your very life will be taken from you, and whose will your stuff be? Friday at noon, I had finished the sermon. But yesterday morning, I was reading the Saturday morning paper. I had the television going on the other side of the room. It was one of the three major networks doing a program. A year before, they had done a program on Saturday morning about hoarders, people you know who just keep buying and buying and store, you know, filling their houses with stuff. But this particular network decided that they would ask one of their young single guys, a reporter, if he would enter into a little experiment. They had one of these persons who counsels hoarders to go with him to his place and to put all of his clothes into one closet and say, for the next six months, you take out of the closet only what you really want to wear, and when you've worn it, you can move it into that closet. And all your stuff we're going to put into boxes as if you were moving somewhere, and only when you need or want something do you take it out of the box, and then you can put it back where it was. And after six months, only 30% of his clothes had been worn, only 30% of his stuff had he ever even looked at, the other 70% he had never touched. And the counselor said, call goodwill, Call the Salvation Army and share. And share. So this brief pericope today, this little cut around, follows that story. That story about bigger barns. I've underlined four things. The first thing, stop striving. Stop worrying. That's what the nations do. And this word is the ethnics, the non-Jews. That's what the Gentiles do. The heathen and the pagan, that's what they do. You know where we get the word worrying? It's an old English word that comes from a word that literally means to choke or strangle. 
to choke or strangle. That's what worrying does. Three weeks ago in my sermon, I quoted Harvey McKay. I read his column in the Tulsa World every week. I'd seen something that I liked that resonated with me. I thought it might with you, and I quoted him. Somebody told him. He's the president of a company up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's been president of this company for more than 50 years. He's been very successful. He sent me a copy of his latest book. I read it last weekend. And in there, he tells a story of Elodie Armstrong. Elodie Armstrong, in her 40s, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Immediately, she wanted to know, how much longer will I be able to walk? The doctor said, well, a fair amount of time. Then we'll get you a cane. All right, and how long will I be able to walk with a cane? Well, a fair amount of time. And then we'll get you aluminum crutches, one for each arm. And how much longer will I be able to walk with them? Well, a reasonable time. And then you'll probably need a wheelchair. So Elodie Armstrong curled up in her bed and started grieving. And then one morning she woke up and she wrote down Commandments 11 through 20. And this is what she wrote. Thou shalt not worry, for worry is the most unproductive of all human activities. Thou shalt not be fearful, for most of the things we fear never come to pass. Thou shalt not cross bridges before you get to them, for no one yet has succeeded in accomplishing this. Thou shalt face each problem as it comes. You can handle only one at a time anyway. Thou shalt not take problems to bed with you. They make very poor bedfellows. Thou shalt not borrow other people's problems. They can take better care of them themselves. Thou shalt not try to relive yesterday. For good or ill, it is gone. Thou shalt count thy blessings, never overlooking the small ones, for a lot of small ones become really big ones. Thou shalt be a good listener, it's very hard to learn something new when you're talking. Number 20, thou shalt not become bogged down by frustration, for 90% of it is rooted in self-pity. She lived 50 years more till she was 97. Number two, look at the birds. They have no barns. They don't tear them down and build bigger ones. Look at the lilies. Look at the green grass of the fields, how God clothes them. Are you not of much more value than one of them? The question is, where does God rate us, homo sapiens, and the whole scope of things? Well, even though the ancient Jewish poets did not know nearly as much as we do today about how our brain functions, they could tell that in humans there were two different things at work here. One, they said, when God finally puffed into us his own ruach, we became a nephesh. The word literally is open mouth, like a baby bird. It's just pecked through its shell, a bundle of appetites. But God also created us with the imago dei, the image of God. That we are both of these. We are very much like all the other primates, as much as 98% like some of them. But we have this amazing frontal lobe of our brains that makes it possible for us alone to project ourselves into the future. All the others are working out of genetic codes. We can project ourselves into the future, and when we do, we get anxious about it. We get anxious. Dr. Audrey West, professor, Lutheran Theological Seminary in Chicago, has written that one of her parents was diagnosed as terminally ill, and the physician said to the rest of the family, you need to get in touch with hospice. 
So they called hospice, and when they arrived, they said, your mother is going to need a hospital bed. Set it up in the living room. Beg your pardon? In the living room. When my father was told by MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, we've done all we can do now, you should contact hospice when you get home. There was no hospice group in my small hometown of Carthage, Texas, but there was one in Longview, 35 miles away, and they said they would come. And when they got there, they said to my mother, you need a hospital bed. Don't set it up in the bedroom back there. Set it up in the living room. This person who's been so important in this family should not be shunted off into a back room but be a part of everything as long as he's here. He lives six more months. Gail and I were going down every other Thursday after work for me, driving 310 miles to give my brother and his wife, my sister and her husband, a little break. My mom wouldn't leave. But for 48 hours, we did the best we could, and then Saturday night, we drove all the way back to Tulsa for me to preach that morning. But every time we would get there, my dad would ask, how's Allison, our daughter-in-law? She was pregnant. She's fine. Now, when is the baby due? Late October, Dad. Okay. Two weeks later, how's Allison? She's fine. Now, when's the baby due? Late October. The pasture out in front of their house was getting taller and taller. A man stopped one day and said, I'd be glad to cut your pasture for you if you'll let me roll it into bales of hay. Dad was a part of that decision. Yeah, that's a good idea. And they let the men cut the pasture, roll it into bales of hay. Somebody had a friend who was getting married discussing the wedding that was about to take place. The next weekend when we got back down there, how was the wedding, Tony? Oh, the wedding was fun. Dad was drifting in and out of consciousness. At one time, a natural gas company was wanting to put another pipeline across their property. They have the right to do that down in Texas, but you have some input about where that pipeline crosses. And Dad was a part of that conversation. Dr. Aubrey West says, do you understand? In the living room, there is dying. And in the dying room, there is living. Josh was born October 20. My father died October 27. It's who we are. We can be anxious. We can worry. This can cause us to want more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. Or we can become not those of little faith, but those of much faith. Underline number three. So quit striving for all these things and instead strive for the kingdom of God. You know the name Jeff Foxworthy? He's a comedian. He's best known probably for his jokes about rednecks. If you go to family reunions cruising for babes, he said, you could be a redneck. Jeff Foxworthy lives in Atlanta, Georgia. He knows rednecks. But this fall, one of the cable systems has him hosting a Bible quiz show. He was interviewed recently. You know much about the Bible, Jeff? Well, he said, I'm certainly not seminary trained, but I've been in church all my life. Really? Oh, yeah. My mom and dad always took us to Sunday school and church. And when I grew up, found the woman I wanted to marry. She and I both thought that was important. And when we had children, we still believed it was important. So I've been in Sunday school and church all my life. Do you know enough about the Bible? I don't know everything. I know some things. He said a few years ago, <clears throat> our preacher asked me if I wouldn't like to be a part of a Bible study group. We had some 
member of the staff teach us for a while, and then he said, okay, you guys know enough to be on your own now. So we decided we'd have barbecue once a week. We'd talk about the Bible. Took us two years to get through Romans, he said, but it was a good two years. <laughs> Lots of good barbecue. We learned more about what Paul was trying to tell us. Then one day he said, a man called me and wanted me to come to the day center for the homeless. I said, what do you really want from me? He said, I've been blessed, and so a lot of people call. They want me to make a contribution to something, or they want me to do a benefit for them and let other people give money to their organization. And the man said, I just want you to come down at noon on Thursday and serve some of these homeless people their food. That's it? That's it. So they said, I went down there, and I dipped food, and I saw some of Atlanta's poor. So when he called me a month later and said, Hey, Jeff, how about coming down and helping me? I said, I'll be there. And after I'd done that several times, he said, Jeff, I want you to teach a men's Bible study here. Really? Yeah. He said, having seen that group a number of times now, I thought, well, if all I can do is tell the story of the prodigal son, it might be enough for this group. But I said, I would. Every six weeks, I start a new group of Bible study at the Day Center for the Homeless. Then one of my daughters, he said, got me involved in a volunteering mission project. We went to a poor, poor country in Africa. We saw people were walking four or five miles to get a bucket of water, dipping an old plastic bucket down in a stream where cows had been defecating. And I saw what our church was doing. We were drilling a water well. And when pipe was set and the pump was put out and he just started pumping and clean water poured out, you should have seen the eyes of those children. Clean water to drink, clean water for cooking, clean water for bathing. I don't know everything, Jeff said, but I know enough to do some good. So do we. We know what the kingdom is. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number four. And then these other things will fall into their proper place. If you are seeking first the kingdom of God, these other things will fall into place. You all remember Dr. Brueggemann, who was here with us last winter. We had tried several times, the committee and I, to get him to come. And finally, after he retired from his professorship, he agreed to come. He's still in much demand. I saw just recently he was preaching at one of the most prestigious preaching symposiums in America, preaching to preachers. And a part of what he said there was reproduced in the Christian Century magazine. He talked to those preachers about Naaman. You remember him? Naaman, the Syrian general who woke up one morning, according to Brueggemann, looked in the mirror, saw a funny spot on his nose, showed it to his wife, and she said, you got leprosy. He knew that was going to put him outside the realms of all social contact when a little girl he'd stolen on his last raid into Israel said, the prophet in Israel could take care of that for you. So he packed up his gold and his silver, and he rushed off to Israel to get help from the prophet Elisha. Do you remember Elisha wasn't much smitten with generals? Generals come, generals go as far as he was concerned. Dr. Brueggemann says what he told the general was, oh, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. And then he said, well, not quite. He did say, go wash yourself in the Jordan River. And the general looked at that muddy little old creek and said, me, we got better rivers than that in Syria. But his entourage said, please, sir, we've come so far. Just wade in the water. And when he walked into the water of the Jordan, all the scales fell off. And he had the skin of a baby's rear end. That's what the Bible says, Brueggemann said. And he, this general said, wow, there is only one God, and he's in Israel. He didn't know the name, Brueggemann said. Notice he didn't know the name. He used a generic term, El, Elohim, a God. Now, the God in Israel. And then he said it came around to the point we all have to get to. What do I owe you? The general said, what do I owe you? And Elisha said, you don't owe me anything. 
Yahweh, he knew the name. The I will be who I will be. Be blessed. Go in peace. The general thought, well, if it's free, I'll just take a couple more mule loads full of this mud along with me in case I ever need it again. And he said again as he turned now, knowing the name, may the name of Yahweh be blessed. I will bless the name of Yahweh for, uh, well, until I get back to Syria. And they had that big welcoming home ceremony in the temple of Rimon in the temple of Rimon, when I'm leaning on the arm of the king in the temple, three times he says the temple of Rimon. We don't know exactly who that was. It's never mentioned again in all the Bible. But it's a pagan god of some sort. And Elisha says to him, go in peace. Go in peace. Why didn't Elisha rant and rave and say, you idiot! You ungrateful wretch. Don't you know the only true God has just made you well and you're going back to the temple of some pagan, heathenistic God? I cannot believe this. And then Brueggemann said, but that's not the business Elisha was in. And it's not the business we're in. We're in the business of healing one leper at a time, whether they're grateful or not.